Today we're going to look at probably the most important Lie algebra. But before we really get started, let's recall a little bit about what a Lie algebra is. So a Lie algebra G is a vector space together with a bilinear map. Usually that's denoted by this bracket. So it takes two inputs, both from G, and gives us an output from G. And it satisfies some conditions, like one of the conditions is skew symmetry. So like X bracket Y is minus Y bracket X. And the other one is called the Jacobi identity, which is a little bit more complicated. So now that we've recalled that definition, let's look at this algebra, which I am saying is one of the most important Lie algebras. It's called SL2 and it's three dimensional. We generally take the names of its basis vectors to be H, E, and F. And since we need this bracket to be defined on all of SL2, it's enough to look at the bracket on H, E, and F. So notice if we bracket H with E, we'll get 2E, so that's one of our defining relations. If we bracket H with F, we'll get minus 2F, that's another defining relation. And if we bracket E with F, we'll get H. That's our last defining relation. And in fact, because of skew symmetry, we don't need any other defining relations. So to start off, I'd like to prove that the following is a nice matrix representation of SL2. And in fact, I did a previous video where we constructed SL2 from its Lie group, and we got this matrix representation. So check that out if you're interested. And so here we'll take H to be the diagonal matrix with entries 1, negative 1. E will be this super diagonal matrix with a 1 there, and then F will be that sub diagonal matrix. So in order to check that this is a matrix representation of SL2, we need to check that these matrices commute in a way that is exactly the same as these bracket relations. So let's do that. Let's, for instance, calculate H, E. So in the matrix world, that'll be H, E minus E, H, or it will be this 1, 0, 0, minus 1 matrix, matrix product with 0, 1, 0, 0 minus the opposite multiplication. So we've got 0, 1, 0, 0, and then 1, 0, 0, minus 1. Okay, so let's do those products, just keeping in mind what the rules for matrix multiplication are. So if we take this row, spin it into this column, notice that we will get zero in this entry. Take this row, spin it into this column, we'll get a one in this entry. And then similarly, we'll get zeros in, that, in those two entries as well. Now we need to subtract the product in the other direction. And so maybe I'll skip the details, but what we end up with is 0, minus 1, 0, 0. But notice that if we add those up, we get 0, 2, 0, 0, which is clearly equal to 2, 0, 1, 0, 0, or 2e. So we've just shown that the matrices that are representing E and H have the same commutation relations as our bracket relation over here. Now, maybe for homework, I'll let you check that these other two matrices commute in the same way that these brackets are defined. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about why this is an important Lie algebra. So we looked at an abstract definition of SL2 as well as a nice matrix representation of SL2. Now we wanna at least partially answer the question, why is SL2 so important? So maybe the first part of this answer is that SL2 is a subalgebra of what I'll call most important Lie algebras. And in fact, this is what we're gonna look at today. And of course, we can't look at all Lie algebras or even all families of Lie algebras, but we'll look at a couple of examples of larger Lie algebras that naturally contain a copy of SL2. But really what's important about this first point is that it leads us to this second point. And that is understanding the representation theory of SL2 is vital to understanding the representation theory of all Lie algebras. And so I'm thinking about doing a kind of bigger video on the representation theory of SL2 because it's like really beautiful. I think that's probably going to be put on the second channel math major though. So check out and subscribe to that channel if you don't want to miss that video. And then finally, this is really like a bonus fact. It doesn't really go in with why SL2 is so important, but it is interesting. 
and that is if you take all three vectors with complex entries, so three-dimensional complex vector space, and the cross product, like you would learn in a multivariable calculus class, that's in fact isomorphic as a Lie algebra to SL2C. But we're not going to go over that here because it's not really that illuminating to look at the isomorphism. It's kind of messy and not very fun. Okay, so now what we'll focus on is SL2 as a subalgebra inside other important Lie algebras. So the most obvious first example after SL2 to look at would be SL3. So as a matrix representation, SL3 is made up of all 3x3 three three matrices where the trace is 0. So the trace is simply just the sum of the diagonal elements. You can actually think about most Lie algebras in their matrix form as being separated into a diagonal part, a negative part, and a positive part. So for the negative part of SL3, it'll be all matrices of the following form. So we'll have 0, 0, 0, and then we'll have something here that's allowed to be non-zero, 0, 0, something here that's allowed to be non-zero, and then something here that's allowed to be non-zero, and then 0. So if you recall, things like F from SL2 were of this form. Like if you were to look at just a two by two matrix and think about the negative part using this shape, you would get that matrix F that we looked at before. And then we've got this diagonal part. I'll be maybe a little clearer with this. So these are diagonal matrices. So I'll just say A0, 0, 0, 0 B0, and then 0, 0, minus A, minus B. I'll put minus A, minus B there because we need the trace to be 0. And these are like kind of playing the role of H, although there are obviously more things playing the role of H in this case because we've got a larger diagonal part, whereas in the case of SL2, we just had one thing in the diagonal part. And then the positive part, you might guess what it looks like. It's really just the transpose of this guy right here. So that means we are allowed to have non-zero things above the diagonal, but everywhere else we have to have zero things. And so these are like generalizations of our vector E from over there. Okay, so now that we've got this kind of picture of the negative part, diagonal part, and positive part of our Lie algebra SL3, we can in fact maybe find three distinct copies of SL2 within SL3. So let's maybe write the representing matrices out below here. Okay, so let's see. Our first one will be 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So that'll play the role of F. And then the H for this choice of F, so we'll have 1, 0, 0, 0, negative 1, 0, and then 0, 0, 0. So maybe like, let's fill this out. So these are our copies of SL2. We're making three of them in these three rows. And what's going on in this first column are all the choices of F, like I've outlined here. In this second column are all the choices of H, and this third column will be all the choices of E. So let's see, E will be in this case 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And I'll leave it to you to check that these choices of F, H, and E satisfy the same commutation relations as these bracket relations for SL2. Okay, so now moving on, we could take a second copy of SL2 that is spanned by the following matrices. So 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. So something that looks like that. And then here we'll have 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, negative 1. So this would be our copy for F for this second copy of SL2. This would be our H for this second copy of SL2. And then finally, the E for this second copy of SL2 will be all zeros except for a one in that spot. Okay, now we've got two copies of SL2 within SL3 and we can get one more. And that's gonna be spanned by the following three matrices. We'll have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. So that, and then one zero zero, a bunch of zeros, and then a negative one in the last entry. 
And then finally, we'll have 0, 0, 1, and then all zeros after that. So just to reiterate what's going on here, we can take the span of these three matrices, and that generates a copy of SL2, which is living inside SL3. We could likewise take the span of these three other matrices and get a second copy of SL2 within this SL3. And then finally, we could take a span of these three matrices and get a third copy of SL2 within this SL3. And I think this picture gives you an idea of how you might write it down for SL4 or SL5 or in general SLN. You get a lot of copies of SL2 in a general SLN. And in fact, there are copies of SL2 in other matrix Lie algebras as well. But we're not going to look at those here. We're going to look at one of my favorite other examples, which is the Wit algebra. Hey guys, Justin here, and I wanted to take just 30 seconds of your time to talk about our Patreon. Patreon is a really important part of me and Michael's mission to democratize math. It allows us an external source of revenue so that we can limit our advertising here and remove as many barriers to learning as possible. That's why we set up an initial $1,000 goal to remove all ads on the second channel. Math Major, where we upload course videos to help students with each subject of math. We'd really appreciate your support, and it looks like I'm out of time, so let's get back to the video. So I previously made a video about the Witt algebra, where we defined it as the derivations on Laurent polynomials. Then we constructed a basis and then found commutation relations for those basis elements. Recall that the basis was given by these ln operators, which was minus z to the n plus 1 times the times d by dz. So you need that derivative in there to be a derivation of this thing right here. So let's real quick recall what we get if we compose two of these operators just to re-derive these commutation relations so we all remember them. Okay, so lm ln, so that's going to be z to the m plus 1, and then the derivative with respect to z of z to the n plus 1 derivative with respect to z. Okay, good. Notice that our minus signs canceled. But now we want to think about this d by dz operating on those two things right there and like the product rule. So let's see what we get. This is going to be z to the m plus 1. Then the derivative with respect to z of z to the n plus 1 will be n plus 1 z to the n plus 1. And then we have d by dz and then plus z to the n plus 1, the derivative with respect to z of the derivative with respect to z, that gives us the second derivative with respect to z. So you can simplify that a little bit if you want to, but let's just jump to what the commutator is. So lm ln bracket, so that's going to be lm ln minus ln lm is equal to m minus n times lm plus n. And so looking at this, this will actually give us infinitely many SL2 triples inside of our Wit algebra, but we'll just look at one of them. So let's maybe put that in this claim here, and that is the span of L minus 1, L0, and L1 is isomorphic to SL2. Okay, so let's prove that on the next board. So we're going to finish this video off by showing that L minus 1, L0, and L1 form something called an SL2 triple. So in other words, they span a copy of SL2 inside of the Wit algebra. So in order to do this, all we need to do is calculate the commutation relations between these three vectors and potentially rescale them so that we get these kind of rules over here. Okay, so let's notice that if we take the commutator of L0 and L1 based off the calculation that we had in a previous video that we rechecked, which I put up there, we get 0 minus 1, which is minus 1, and then L0 plus 1, so that's minus L1. So we need to do some scaling, but it looks like L1 will play the role of F because we get this minus sign out front. Now next, let's look at L0, L minus 1. So that's going to be 0 minus negative 1, so that'll be 1, and then we'll get L minus 1. We'll get L minus 1 because we have 0 plus negative 1. So this has a positive eigenvalue with respect to this action by L0. So this looks like it's playing the role of E, although we need to rescale as well. 
Okay, and then finally, let's look at L1, L minus one, and see what we get. So here we're gonna get one minus negative one. So one minus negative one is two, and then L zero because that's one plus negative one. But the fact that we get a two out of this really gives us motivation to set H equal to two L zero. And then observe that we could put a two in here, in here, and we'll end up with a two out here and out here. And that provides us with our full map. So now we can do the assignment. So H is assigned to two L zero, E is assigned to L minus one, and then F is assigned to L one. And because of these calculations that we've just made above, this algebra, and because of these calculations that we've made above, we see that these, and by these calculations that we've seen here, we've seen that we in fact do have a copy of SL2. So maybe I'll leave you a little bit of a homework exercise and that is to explore if you have other copies of SL2 within the WIT algebra, like perhaps maybe L minus N, L zero and L N for some other value of N. So does that also form an SL2 triple? And what's the rescaling factor that you have to use there if so? And that's a good place to stop.